In the early hours of the new year in 2009, just a few weeks before Barack Obama's inauguration as president, gunshots were fired in Oakland, California. A transit police named Johannes Messerly discharged his pistol, striking an unarmed 22-year-old African-American named Oscar Grant. Grant was handcuffed and laying face down on a public transportation platform. Many witnesses, many of whom were returning to Oakland after New Year's Eve festivities, were taken aback by the incident, and some even videotaped it on their iPhones. Soon after, the African-American community in Oakland reacted with fury, and the demonstration swelled from a small meeting to a large gathering of people demanding justice. If you enjoy videos on this channel, please leave a like and a sub so more people can see this. This outpouring of emotion may have occurred regardless of the circumstances. However, Grant's death, which occurred just weeks before the country's first black president was about to take office, felt like a rude awakening to the reality of racial injustice. Police violence has long been a reality in California, but there was a widespread notion that the country had entered a post-racial era. The spirit of optimism that had pervaded the African-American community in 2008 suddenly seemed far away and unrealistic. Following in the footsteps of Grant's family, a grassroots movement arose in the Bay Area. Its major goal was to persuade prosecutors to charge and prosecute Maserly. Sustained pressure was applied through a succession of protests, marches, college activism, public talks, and organizational sessions, eventually pushing local authorities to prosecute Maserly with murder. This was the first murder trial in 15 years involving a California police officer for an on-duty death. Maserly was eventually found guilty of involuntary manslaughter and sentenced to less than a year in prison. Despite its limits, this local movement predicted future events. However, early in his term, with the lingering effects of the recession painfully felt in African-American neighborhoods, hints of tension between the black president and his support base surfaced. During this time, black America was experiencing a terrible economic collapse, with black wealth eroding and black unemployment reaching worrying double-digit levels. Against this backdrop, civil rights leaders approached Obama about developing policies to address the issue of black unemployment. In response, he declared, I have a clear responsibility to protect the interests of every citizen. That is my responsibility as President of the United States. Every day, I attempt to push for policies that will have the greatest impact on the greatest number of people allowing them to realize the American dream. Although this answer was unimpressive, any dissatisfaction was not reflected in his approval ratings. By 2011, when black unemployment had risen to 13%, an impressive 86% of black Americans supported the president's overall job performance. However, 56% were unhappy with his oversight of Wall Street and major financial institutions. For African Americans, Obama's presidency was defined mostly by his unwillingness to publicly address how racial prejudice was harming the efficiency of his administration's recovery efforts. In contrast, Obama was far less hesitant to publicly chastise African Americans for a variety of acts that appeared to accord with stereotypes. Parenting approaches and nutritional choices were among the behaviors examined, as were sexual standards and television viewing patterns. The emphasis on criticizing poor and working-class black people without acknowledging how the criminal justice system has disproportionately taken black parents from their children's lives appears dishonest. When Obama talks about missing black fathers, he fails to mention the disparities in arrests and sentencing that lead to the overrepresentation of missing black men. The sparse media conversation around Obama's candidacy highlighted the need to rein down the nation's criminal justice system's ravenous imprisonment impulses, particularly in relation to black people. This is despite the fact that approximately a million African Americans are incarcerated, and one out of every four black men aged 20 to 29 is a victim of the criminal justice system. Throughout his first administration, Obama paid no attention to the growing concerns about police enforcement and incarceration. Even as Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, revealed the catastrophic effects of mass incarceration and systematic corruption in the judicial system on black families. It's critical to remember that these problems did not start with Obama. 
However, it would be overly simplistic to believe that African Americans did not consider the negative consequences of policing in jail when they voted for him in large numbers. His unwillingness to tackle the consequences of systemic inequality gradually weakened younger African Americans' faith in his presidency's revolutionary potential. There was a unique moment when the whole African American community faced Barack Obama's decision not to use his presidential authority to intervene on behalf of African Americans. This turning point occurred when Troy Davis, a black man on death row in Georgia, came to public attention. It was widely assumed that he had been wrongfully convicted, implying that by the fall of 2011, he faced the prospect of execution for a crime he had not actually committed. Davis' claims of innocence were not isolated. He had long fought for his exoneration and life with his sister Martina Davis Correa and anti-death penalty activists. By September 2011, an international organization was aggressively advocating for his release from death row. Protests grew in magnitude and intensity as the appointed date of death approached. As the global movement to prevent Davis's execution gathered traction, protests erupted around the world, and support from famous personalities worldwide became increasingly ardent. The European Union, as well as the governments of France and Germany, made urgent requests to the United States to halt his execution. Amnesty International and former FBI Director William Sessions both made similar calls. Vincent Fort, a Democratic member of the Georgia Senate, urged those in charge of carrying out the execution to decline. We strongly advise the injection team not to follow your directions. Do not start the fatal injection substances flowing. By refusing to participate, you assist to make the execution, which is morally wrong, more difficult to carry out. As the execution of Davis loomed on September 20th, people throughout the world expected Obama to take action or respond in some way. He did not, however, issue a statement and remained idle. Instead, he outsourced the responsibility to his press secretary, Jay Carney, who delivered a message on his behalf. The statement accepted that the president should not intervene in a state-led trial. Finally, the African-American president conceded to the ideals of state sovereignty. This served as a wake-up call for Generation O, bringing to light the constraints that limit black presidential authority. It wasn't because Obama was unable to intervene, as his advisors said, but rather because he chose to abstain. The Troy Davis protests had a huge influence, as evidenced by the day after Davis' execution by the state of Georgia. In response to his death, Amnesty International and the crusade against capital punishment held a day of protest. The march drew over a thousand people, who finally converged on a small campsite on Wall Street known as Occupy Wall Street. Trayvon Martin's death in Sanford, Florida in the winter of 2012 was a watershed moment. Martin's death, like Emmett Till's nearly 57-year-old murder, destroyed the myth of a post-racial America. Till was a little child who was lynched by white men during his summer vacation in Mississippi in 1955 over a perceived racial offense. This heinous deed exposed the racist violence that was at the heart of the world's preeminent democracy. Till's mother, Mamie, selected an open casket burial to highlight this reality, revealing to the world the degree of her son's mutilation and death in a country that claimed to be the land of freedom. Martin's alleged wrongdoings included strolling home in a hoodie, holding a phone conversation, and minding his own business. George Zimmerman, who is now considered a major threat, was previously portrayed as an aspiring security guard. He racial profiled Martin and told to the 911 operator that Martin appeared suspicious or high on drugs. Martin, in actuality, was a 17-year-old teenager heading home from a convenience store. Zimmerman pursued him, confronted him, and eventually shot him in the chest, killing him. When the cops arrived on the scene, they accepted Zimmerman's version of events without question. Because of Martin's color, they assumed he was the instigator and treated him as such. He was recognized as a John Doe, with no attempt made to determine whether he lived in the region or had been reported missing. More information emerged as the story progressed via the media, revealing that Martin had been the victim of an unlawful killing. Trayvon Martin was lynched within a few weeks of his arrest. Protests erupted across the country in response, unified by a simple demand. Arrest George Zimmerman for Trayvon Martin's murder.
The fury was fueled in part by a glaring double standard. If Martin had been white and Zimmerman had been black, Zimmerman would have been arrested immediately, if not sentenced more severely. For weeks, Obama deftly avoided confronting the issue, frequently emphasizing that it was a local affair. Obama finally addressed the problem publicly after more than a month. He joked that if he had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin. He went on to say that while he thought about Trayvon's case, he also thought of his own children. Simultaneously, he underlined the importance of every parent in the United States, fully investigating every aspect of the occurrence. He emphasized the necessity of collaborative investigations, including federal, state, and local officials, to determine how this awful occurrence occurred. Obama couldn't declare the obvious, but his choice to address the issue reflected the growing traction of the street protests that had been gathering force for several weeks. Martin's assassination had crossed borders, becoming a cause of national and international embarrassment. While black people recognized that Obama, as president, could not personally lead a social movement against police brutality, the question remained. Why didn't he use his position to emphasize the sorrow and wrath felt by black communities? After all, it was for situations like this that black voters elected Obama to the president. It's difficult to predict when a specific moment may blossom into a full-fledged movement. The arrest of George Zinnerman 45 days after he viciously murdered Trayvon Martin was the culmination of weeks of protests. Many of these protests were organized using social media, avoiding the influence of established civil rights organizations that were more conservative in their approach. George Zimmerman was found not guilty of Trayvon Martin's murder in the summer of 2013, more than a year after his arrest. His acquittal brought to light the persistent burden that black people face. Even in death, Trayvon Martin would be portrayed unfairly as a delinquent and an aggressor, while George Zinnerman would be portrayed unfairly as the victim. The judge even instructed both sides to avoid using the term racial profiling in the courtroom, let alone using it to explain Zinnerman's targeting of Martin. In response to the decision, Obama addressed the nation, noting the case's deep emotional impact. Despite his strong feelings, he highlighted that the country is governed by laws, and a jury had reached a conclusion. He invited everyone to think about how future tragedies like this one may be avoided, both as individuals and as a nation. This burden falls on all of us as citizens. What does it mean for a country to uphold the principle of being governed by laws when those rules are not equally applied? A two-tiered criminal justice system evolves, treating African Americans and whites differently. As a result, there are obvious and prejudicial disparities in penalties that stretch across different aspects of the American legal architecture. This two-tiered legal system suited George Zimmerman. He was free to roam for several weeks until public outpourings forced officials to apprehend him. Furthermore, unlike Trayvon Martin, who was killed, Zimmerman was not subjected to drug testing. This dual standard undermined claims that the United States was established on legal foundations. Obama's plea for individual introspection revealed his lack of solutions. Alicia Garza, a community organizer, took to Facebook in the aftermath of the verdict with a simple hashtag, Black Lives Matter. This simple but powerful reaction clearly addressed the dehumanization and criminalization that led to Martin's erroneous suspicion and the police's subsequent failure to investigate his identity. This hashtag served as a strong pushback to the ongoing devaluation, inequity, and bigotry that diminishes the worth of black lives. It summarized the essence of these complicated concerns in three simple sentences. Following the intermittent spread of the Black Lives Matter movement, a number of police officers were tragically killed in Dallas and Baton Rouge, refocusing the nation's attention on their deaths. President Barack Obama immediately condemned the assault as cruel, planned, and nasty. While every loss of life is tragic, the fact remains that the murder of hundreds of police officers is not a yearly event. It is unusual for a police officer's life to be taken without legal repercussions. The level of violence sustained by police officers does not correspond to the level of violence inflicted on them. As a result, when the president writes an official letter to law enforcement in an attempt to demonstrate unshakable support, it contributes to the continuous glorifying of police valor. 
This view, in turn, shields them from accountability and impedes change implementation. When Obama claims that law enforcement personnel regard imperiled civilians as individuals connected to them rather than strangers, one wonders if he is referring to incidents like Freddie Gray, Michael Brown, Rekia Boyd, or Ayanna Stanley Jones. His comments to police officers about treating them as family and being willing to make sacrifices for them raise concerns about his approach. It's unclear whether that definition of family includes the 13 women who were sexually assaulted by Daniel Holtzclaw in Oklahoma City, as well as the countless more who do not disclose such crimes. Your dedication to the protection of others takes precedence above your own, demonstrating that patriotism includes concern for one another. Obama's statement seems disconnected from the video footage obtained by Diamond Reynolds in the aftermath of the Philando Castoff shooting, in which her four-year-old daughter was present. Was that cop actually concerned about their safety? Even when confronted with opposition, you remain protectors, even when memories of Ferguson emerge, recalling the use of tanks, rubber bullets, and tear gas to disperse a community. You find yourself in situations where split-second decisions, including your own, have the ability to affect the fate of multiple lives, including your own, as illustrated in In Harm's Way. In a letter to law enforcement, Obama expresses worry about a crucial issue. Why do these quick decisions regularly result in the killing of black people or their terrible dread for survival? If you like this video, please show your gratitude by liking, subscribing, and activating notifications for future material. We sincerely appreciate your interest. Catch you guys in the next one.